being here. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to go over uh, some housekeeping and introductions uh, and agenda. We'll we'll uh, we'll get it going. So uh, this is being recorded, and uh, we will share the recording with you and other people who are not able to make it afterwards, most likely early next week. And then you can share that with uh, people who you might like to. You can rewatch it, um, etc. Please don't record it. Don't record the audio or the video. Uh, we appreciate that. Uh, everyone can see and hear us okay. I'm assuming if if not, we would have been notified, hopefully by someone by now. Uh, everyone can see and hear okay. Can Maybe can I get a thumbs up or something like that from, from people? All right, great. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, appreciate that participation. Um, this is a safe space, so people can ask anything. As we said when we were uh, sharing this webinar, there's nothing that is off limits. You can ask whatever you want. This is a safe space. You can ask anonymously if you want. You can change your name in here to anonymous. Uh, there's there's no pressure at all to identify yourself. And if you want to, of course, it is nice to know who you are, where where in the world you are. Uh, as Dr. Minnell mentioned, if you have a connection academy that you want to share, uh, it's nice, but only what you're comfortable with. Um, we're going to, um, and I'm going to introduce both of us, talk about the agenda, and then we'll get to it. So my name is Sam Mandel. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Ketamine Clinics Los Angeles. This is Dr. Stephen Mandel, co-founder and president. And we're also father and son, hence the same last name. And we have been providing IV infusions of ketamine for mental health for a decade now. We just celebrated 10 years of IV infusions for mental health. We were one of the first clinics in the country, our clinic, uh, Ketamine Clinics Los Angeles, and uh, we have really pioneered this treatment. Um, Dr. Mandel, as an expert, world-renowned uh, physician clinically in, in his approach to this work has really uh, paved the way for other providers in the field and for other modalities uh, like uh, in psychedelics. Um, he is a board-certified anesthesiologist. He also has a master's degree in psychology. And we've been working closely together for the last 10 years to bring this treatment to as many people as we can and to help to uh, disseminate accurate information about it. So we're gonna just talk about what is ketamine? What is ketamine infusion therapy? How does it work? How does it work in our clinic? We're gonna spend around 15 or 20 minutes with that. It's something, frankly, we could talk about for hours. We're gonna try to be really succinct and just go over the basic information because really we wanna answer your questions. We want to talk about whatever it is that you, our wonderful participants, want to hear about. So that's what we're going to try to spend most of our time on. Uh, this is scheduled to end at 2 p.m. Pacific time. We are going to go a little bit over if needed. If there, if we can't get through all the questions, our aim is to answer every single one. Uh, we will have a hard stop at 2.30 Pacific time. So just keep that in mind. And without um, further ado, uh, Dr. Mandel, do you want to start us off on just a little bit about you know, uh, the um, maybe one of the recent events that's happened in, in the media and kind of the main reason why we decided to do this in the first place? Sure. Uh, after the very unfortunate drowning of, of uh, Matthew Perry, which uh, involved his use of ketamine not for therapeutic purposes, there's a tremendous amount of interest in the public because he was very widely adored. And in the community of people being treated with ketamine, there was a great deal of alarm that they might be at risk that they didn't appreciate that they were. And we really are, are sad that Mr. Perry passed. And um, we're sad about the circumstances. And in a way, he's given us a gift by calling people's attention to what's going on, something I believe he would have been very in favor of, so that we can provide education and clarification. Yeah, thank you for that. And, you know, it's important for people to understand just to kind of address this right out the gate. Uh, Mr. Perry had more than 10 times the amount of ketamine in his system when he passed uh, than we would use in a clinical setting for, for therapeutic use for mental health. He had enough to produce general anesthesia. 
um, more than 10 times what, what is provided for mental health. He also had buprenorphine, an opioid in his system, as well as a, a benzodiazepine, another sedative, lorazepam. So, and he was alone in a hot tub and he became incapacitated and drowned. So th these, uh, this combination of, of variables and circumstances is so, so far outside of uh, ketamine therapy and ketamine in a clinical environment. There's, there's absolutely no correlation between the two. And, that. and as, as sad and as unfortunate as that situation is, we really want to make the distinction and we really want to address the concerns and fears that a lot of people have expressed uh, since this news has, has spread. So I think we can just move on to a little bit more about what is ketamine, for those who don't know, and um, well, what is ketamine therapy, and, and talk a little bit about the protocol. What do, you, what do you think? Sure. And I don't know how deep we want to get into the weeds. I'm going to stay very high level. And if people want to drill down, let them do so by asking questions. We'll take your lead. A ketamine is an anesthetic approved by the FDA for use in humans in 1970. It became rapidly the most widely used anesthetic in the world and was so for about three decades. It's still among the most widely used anesthetics on earth. In the 90s and zeros, it turned out that this same medicine by a different dose level and different route of administration was remarkably effective at treating depression, suicidality and PTSD and associated afflictions. That's how I got involved, reading that and getting very excited about it. I had completed everything short of my PhD in clinical psychology when I went to medical school. And this was like a marriage made in heaven. I could use my anesthesia skills and my psychology skills and relieve suffering, which is what I went to medical school to do. And I got I turned Sam onto this and he got also very excited. And I tried this on a few patients. Uh, who were actually friends and loved ones of colleagues. I was running a, a recovery room at the time, so I had free use of a facility. And uh, we started doing infusions. And we were just astounded at the results. They were really embarrassingly good. They were like drinking the Kool-Aid good. Uh, like, yeah. you can't, tell, can't tell colleagues that because they'll think you're deranged. Anyway, that's what started it. That was in late 13, early 14. Yeah. And we had the clinic in 14. Yeah. I volunteered for a uh, teen line when I was 12 years old, which is a teen to teen suicide prevention hotline where I took calls from, from teenagers in crisis a couple of days a week after school. And that was kind of my first exposure to mental health, I guess, in a more formal capacity. And grew up with a lot of friends and family who have struggled with uh, mental health, addiction, people we've lost to suicide. So this work is personal for both of us. It's near and dear to our hearts. And um, that's why we do it. So um, just a little bit about ketamine now. Uh, in addition to its use as anesthetic, uh, it's also used in, uh, in veterinary medicine uh, as well as human medicine. Uh, so a lot of people know of it as a horse tranquilizer or a cat tranquilizer. Uh, it's used as an analgesic, as a pain reliever. Uh, it is also a drug of abuse um, that people refer to as Special K and other nicknames uh, that people use recreationally or self-medicate with. So it's a ubiquitous drug with a lot of different uses. And that's kind of one of the interesting things about it is uh, often people who know of it through any one of those areas of life are confident that that's really the whole story behind it. But it's just one part of the identity of, of ketamine, which has many. So... Uh, as Dr. Menno mentioned, you know, in the last 20, 25 years, especially the growing body of research on ketamine for mental health has been expanding and the safety and efficacy of IV infusions of ketamine for the treatment of depression, PTSD, suicidality, anxiety, and other mental health conditions has grown substantially. I want viewers to know that there's more than 200 clinical papers that have been published on the use of ketamine for depression and other mood disorders at leading institutions all over the world. And you can view these online now at clinicaltrials.gov. Um, at least probably 70 or 80 at this point have results published and available for viewing. So this is way beyond anecdotal. 
uh, there's a, a huge amount of, of research to support this work. And in the decade we've been doing it, uh, we've provided more than 30,000 infusions and our results are 83% success rate for patients who are struggling. Do you wanna talk a little bit more about the treatment, Dr. Mandel, kind of how it works, how ketamine therapy is a little different from some of uh, ketamine's earlier uses as an anesthetic in terms of the dose and the protocol behind it? Sure. I'd like to emphasize what you just said, though. Um, because you said a whole bunch of things that may just roll past people. We give intravenous infusions via an infusion pump at doses that are tailored to the patient. When we say we have an 83% success rate, we actually measure that. That's not an average of a couple of months. That's an average of over six years of serious paper and pencil measurements like the VEC, like the mattress, like the PHQ-9. And uh, success for us is a 50% or greater reduction in the depression scores on those instruments. So when we say 83%, we're serious. Uh, not all clinics have that level of success. I wish they did. Uh, we don't have a magic. Our big deal is absolute meticulous focus on the patient and what the patient's needs are and tailoring all of the care to the patient. This is not ketamine. This is ketamine plus care. Ketamine unsupervised can lead to some very bad outcomes. That's part of what brought some of you here today. It can also lead to suboptimal outcomes. And we can talk about that. Uh, other routes of administration can be very effective. They are not as effective. Yeah, some of the others are, you know, ketamine can be used. When it's used recreationally, it's usually snorted as a powder. When it's used clinically, therapeutically, it, it's, it's, you know, often IV infusions in the way that we provide it. It's uh, intramuscular injections, IM, and also um, intranasal, nasal sprays. There is an FDA approved version that's S-ketamine under the brand name Spravato. It was approved in March of 2019, uh, which is a nasal spray. And uh, there's also uh, sublingual lozenges or trochies, uh, which are often uh, prescribed to patients through compounding pharmacies. So there's a lot of different ways that people are prescribing or, or taking ketamine, both uh, therapeutic and non-therapeutic uses. Uh, as far as what we focus on and specialize in, it's IV infusions because the, the safety and efficacy is so much higher with the IV route. And as Dr. Mandel said, I want to underline that there is value in the other routes of administration and there are people doing meaningful work with them. And there's also nuanced advantages to the IV route in both safety and efficacy. And I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about some of those advantages, Dr. Mandel. Well, IV enables the person giving the care to adjust the dosage up or down virtually instantly to stop the procedure if it's not agreeable to the patient. The most important thing in ketamine treatment, if it's to be therapeutic, is set and setting. It was discovered a long time ago. Uh, and that it probably counts for close to 90% of the variance. We control the setting. We contribute to the control of the mental set by how we prepare the patient. Again, I emphasize this is not ketamine. This is ketamine plus care. And the care, although it wouldn't have the same effect without the medicine, the medicine will not have the same effect without the care. Yeah, that therapeutic relationship is really critical. And, you know, our aim with anyone who we take care of is to really help them to feel first and foremost safe and then comfortable and relaxing in a, in a clean and safe and comfortable environment. So we've gone to great lengths to create a clinic and a space and have a team that's very compassionate, very warm, very welcoming, that has all of the state-of-the-art equipment for safety, hospital-grade monitoring equipment, so monitoring patients' uh, pulse, 
oxygen saturation, respiratory rate, EKG, and blood pressure, which we feel is important to be done during all infusions. And it's not something that all providers of ketamine are doing, but we recommend as a best practice, we feel is important. We have uh, recliners that are very comfortable. People can lay completely flat in them. We provide pillows, blankets, noise canceling headphones, an unlimited selection of relaxing music, and a really, really uh, tuned in and experienced staff of uh, different uh, levels of clinicians. And so this is what the experience looks like for people who may not be familiar. Everyone gets a private room. They're monitored the entire time with eyes and ears on them throughout the course of their experience. And as Dr. Mandel mentioned, the IV route with a digital syringe pump that we use instead of an IV bag enables the practitioner to increase or decrease the rate of the infusion. Because it's not just a shot or a bolus where we push all of the medicine all at once. It's given gradually over a period of 50 to 55 minutes. So it's a continuous, slow, steady infusion. And that rate can be increased or decreased to kind of deepen and intensify the experience or to lighten it. And different patients require a different rate of infusion for optimal benefit and comfort uh, from not only among different people, but among different infusions. So from one infusion to the next. You know, well, thanks for laying that all out, Sam. The patient's comfort, uh, the safety of course is paramount, but the patient's comfort level is super important. When I said set and setting account for 90% of the variance, a substantial portion of the remainder is anxiety level. Mm -hmm. The patient who is chill and curious has a much better result than the patient who is tense, anxious, and wanting to be uh, or unable to relinquish control. This is not something we do to people. This is something we do with people. And their trust and their participation are a crucial part of the getting a good outcome. Absolutely. I think it'd be great if we could talk briefly just about kind of how and why the treatment works and then jump into the Q&A. Uh, you know, maybe you want to touch on some of the science and I can touch a little bit on the on the psychological, but um you know, I'm thinking those that two pronged aspects of the kind of what exactly is going on and why why is this helping people? Well, big picture, uh, our spiritual selves and our mental selves and our physical selves are often um, not communicating very well, and the ketamine helps to break down the barriers between them uh, on a more slightly more granular level, there are networks in the brain of dis, uh, parts of the brain that are distant from one another, but have direct connections with one another. One of them is called the default mode network. And that's the seat of a lot of your rumination. When you're not active, when you're not focused on something, it's your default mode network. It's whispering in your ear, uh, sometimes quite critical and harsh judgmental things. The ketamine turns down the volume of that default mode network and makes the depressed person who typically is receiving some very nasty feedback about themselves and enables them to turn down that volume and to appreciate sometimes for the first time that there are alternative points of view and that that is a point of view, not a report of facts. Uh, on a still more granular level, uh, ketamine is sort of biphasic in that it has an immediate emotional impact. It also starts a cascade that leads to brain-derived neurotropic factor being elaborated and actual growth of dendrites and increased receptor density. Uh, in a way that promotes uh, neuroconnectivity. Uh, in laboratory models, the areas of the brain specifically associated with depression regrow and plump up, and the connections among them increase. You know, you have the neurotransmitters that are typically, you know, modulated or, or addressed with uh, antidepressant medications like serotonin with SSRIs, 
you know, dopamine, norepinephrine. But one of the things that ketamine stimulates that makes it a little bit unique is glutamate and it's acting on the glutamatergic system, which is a neurotransmitter that's actually present in 85% of the brain. It's the most abundant. It's kind of interesting that a lot of the focus has not been on it as far as uh, addressing depression. So ketamine really has a unique way of acting and affecting uh, the brain, the mechanism of action. And that's one of the reasons why it works in treatment resistant cases when nothing else does. So most of our patients, virtually almost all of them have been considered uh, treatment resistant when they arrive to us, which means they've tried at least two or more medications or treatments and have not benefited adequately. Many of them have tried almost everything out there. I mean, long lists of medications, sometimes ECT, you know, shock therapy, electroconvulsive therapy, uh, TMS, you know, talk therapy, and all, often all kinds of other modalities as well, and gotten very little to no benefit. And they do benefit from IV Infusions Academy. They often benefit within a matter of days or maybe within one week. So it's a very, very fast acting treatment. And it often works when nothing else does. So I think it's important for people to know that. I uh, also think we should just touch on the psychological aspect of the treatment before we jump into the Q&A here. And we have 48 questions in there, which is amazing. And I want to try to get through as many of them as, as quickly as we can. Uh, but why don't we just quickly touch on the kind of experiential component of ketamine that also makes it unique and effective? Big picture, ketamine gets people unstuck. They become able to focus, to concentrate, and to have energy around their intentions. You know, most of us who uh, have been depressed know that we know what we need to do, but we can't get the energy or the focus to do it. Ketamine is the enabler, is the energizer. Unfortunately, it doesn't give direction. It gives force. And that's why it must be accompanied by therapy if it's to have a good outcome. Yeah, when people have the infusion experience, it is a dissociative anesthetic. It's really psychedelic in many regards. And so people have this detachment of mind and body, this kind of separation. They're able to get a more unique or, or kind of an objective view of themselves, of their past revisiting past trauma in ways that are not as triggering uh, as much of an emotionally taxing response to think through these things, to get new perspective on them, to find more compassion for yourself and for other people, and just to get closure. And that's extremely valuable for people. So the actual infusion experience itself, in addition to the neurochemical effects that are going on in the brain, is very powerful. And it's something that also really sets ketamine apart from really most other mental health treatments. So I, I want to underline that and the importance of it and the variability of it as well. It can be spiritual, it can be uh, meditative, it can be relaxing. Sometimes it can be challenging, you know, material can come up. People can rework through trauma. Uh, it can be a very inspiring. They can gain insight, epiphanies, re realizing about negative patterns of, of thinking or ways of being or engaging with the people who are closest to them and realizing this thing is actually so much more important to me than I realized, or I've been making this other thing such a big deal and it's actually really not. And I don't want to continue to give it my attention and my energy. So there, there's a lot of really valuable processing and inner work that happens during the infusion experience. And as Dr. Manel is saying, people take that and then can work through it even further after and talk therapy. And, and that's really where a tremendous amount of healing can occur for people with, with ketamine. You know, you're in talk therapy for 10 years and there's an elephant in the room. And the therapist may be aware of it, but he or she can't get you past it and you can't see it. Well, ketamine enables you to see it. And not only to see it, but to realize that you created it and you don't have to have that. You can go on in your life without it. It doesn't have to be about who's better or who's worse, or who's good or bad, or the fact that you're right and your brother's wrong. Of course you're right. So what? You're both beautiful. You're both better off loving one another than you are hating one another. You'll gain nothing other than a, you know, a kind of weird, not very useful satisfaction from blaming. And ketamine gets you off of that stuff. 
or it enables you, facilitates you doing it. You can't take ketamine and expect all this to happen. Take ketamine and then have the therapy and this will happen most of the time. That's great. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, again, want to underline it's, it's the ketamine and the care and it's the active involvement of the patient. A lot of people have the idea that they are going to see a doctor or someone and have something done to them or for them that's going to fix something. And that's not what our philosophy is or what this is about. It's really about empowering people to heal and to find the inner healer in themselves and to be able to do the work that they need in order to have meaningful and, and lasting change. So uh, without further ado, let's jump into the Q&A. We have a lot of questions, a lot, a lot of questions. I hope we can cover all of them. Um, <laughs> the first question I see here, um, <laughs> How come, I, I'm sorry, but I have to read it because it's so good. Uh, how come all the Mandel men are, and I'm not making this up, I swear to God. How come all the Mandel men are so good looking at all ages? That's a great, uh, that's a great question. Thank you so much for that. I don't know who that was. It says it's an anonymous attendee, but we so appreciate. That's a great question to start with. Um, a fun little icebreaker question. So. Fundamentally, uh, we started out with very lucky genes and then we are happy. We are doing something we love to do. This is amazing work to be part of, to really transform lives. We haven't mentioned suicide. Ketamine therapy is the most effective redu reducer or eliminator of suicide that we know of. Not by a little, by a lot. And it works fast and it's safe. And to be a part of that um, It's very, very, very gratifying. And some of it gets reflected in looks. I didn't start out good looking. I got this way from kidding. <laughs> yeah, it's it's beyond gratifying. I mean, and we tell our team all the time, don't let it ever get old. I mean, any of you can go and take a look at our Google or our Yelp reviews and you'll see hundreds, literally hundreds of reviews from real patients. They're real people. They're very long and detailed uh, stories of hope and healing. And it just is it's amazing. I mean, there's no words for it. And the emails we get, the comments, uh, the calls from people say, you gave me my life back. I mean, there's no, there's no greater feeling. And uh, we have to constantly tell our, our team and we have an amazing team. There's over a dozen of us, psychiatrists, registered nurses, psychiatric nurse practitioners, administrative staff. We're all uh, work together in person in the office. Uh, none of us are remote. So we actually are spending time together and that's how we like it. And uh, we have a type on, but we, we have team meetings and we talk about this and we say, you know, don't let this stuff get old. Don't let it get old just because we've gotten that, you know, 200th, 250th, whatever. It, it, it's each, every individual is special, unique, and that is an incredible experience for that person. And it's just so gratifying. So uh, anyways, let's, let's keep it moving. We'll jump into more of these actual question questions because there's a lot of them. So uh, this one is actually just Another positive one to thank you. Just someone saying thank you for, you know, for your work, for talking about what you've done after Mr. Perry. We can thank you for that. We appreciate that, Mariska. Um, let's see, what are the uh, potential health risks that could be associated? Great question. How does that risk change in a clinical setting versus home-based? Okay, thank you, Christian. Yeah, this is a great, uh, a great question. So uh, if you want to start with uh, answering that one, Dr. Mandel. In healthy patients, uh... Ketamine infusion therapy under the care of a skilled person has virtually no health risks. Um, please hear me. New paragraph, new sentence. If you abuse ketamine in large quantities for a long time, you may have bladder issues. You may, may develop some liver or pancreatic issues. There are some people who believe you could develop cognitive issues. There's no good data on that. None of these things, which really can happen to people who use ketamine, like we give people usually under 100 milligrams. I'm talking about over a gram and not three times a week for two weeks and you're done, but a gram plus a day for years. About 20% of those, 16, 20% of those would develop uh, bladder or, or kidney problems, and they can be very severe. And they don't come on like you're throwing a switch, they come on gradually. And typically the user says, well, what I'm getting from this is 
better than the, the pain. I'm going to keep going. People have ample warning. It's not subtle. But in therapeutic hands, ketamine cystitis, which is a separate entity from chronic interstitial cystitis. With bladder, bladder cystitis, yeah. Interstitial, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, is a known entity. It virtually does not happen in the clinic. Now, there are subsets of patients for which you have to be a little more concerned. And those are people who've had interstitial cystitis, non ketamine related, because the ketamine treatment can provoke it. I will say that IV ketamine treatment provokes it much less than IM or intranasal or subcutaneous, uh, sublingual. I can explain that later if anyone's interested. But the bladder doesn't care root of administration. The bladder cares about total ketamine that the, re that the kidneys have to clear. And since uh, if you put it up your nose, uh, only about 40% goes to your brain, you have to take about two and a half times as much to get the same effect we can give you IV. And that two and a half times has to be cleared by your kidney and sit in your bladder. Yeah, I want to I want to uh, add on to that. You know, in the clinic, I don't know if we mentioned this, and uh, I hope you'll forgive us jumping around a little bit. But when we're talking about our protocol, it's a series of six infusions over the course of two to three weeks. I don't know if we made that clear, and that's pretty typical for uh, IV infusions for mental health treatment. Six infusions over two to three weeks, and ours are fifty to fifty-five minutes long. Most places are providing a forty-minute infusion, so ours are a little longer. We give a little bit more medicine. The reason why I mention this um, to kind of uh, jump on to answering this question is that you're not taking ketamine daily or long term. Uh, after you complete a series, you would return for a pair of booster infusions for follow up, usually just two infusions a day or two apart on an as needed basis. And a lot of people will do that maybe two or three times a year ongoingly. So they would come in, you know, every three or four months, just for example, for two infusions in, in the same week. And then they'd be good for another three or four months or so. And as a matter of fact, as time goes on, they will come back less often because they're able to get more and more mileage from their boosters. This is a very different model than taking a pill every day or than a, a someone who's misusing ketamine or abusing it or self-medicating, you could say, with it and taking it daily or in much, much higher doses. And because of the differences of the bioavailability of among groups of administration, as, as Dr. Mendel mentioned, IV being 100% bioavailable, nasal being maybe around 40%, people are taking much higher doses uh, to get the effects that they're seeking, which is much more of an intense rush uh, to produce a euphoric experience, which is different from what our aim and goal is therapeutically and clinically. I also just want to add, because we talk about the abuse or misuse of ketamine and some people have an inaccurate idea and understanding of what that looks like. I just want to say for, for everyone here, ketamine is not physically addictive. It does not uh, create a, a dependency in the way that opioids or alcohol or nicotine do, or even uh, benzodiazepines or, or other uh, medications, often prescription medications that do. Ketamine does not. Uh, some people do use it as a means of escape in the same way that people use ice cream or chocolate uh, as a means of, of escape uh, or any number of other activities. But it, it is actually not creating a, a physical uh, dependence in the way that other substances do. Um, Christian uh, had a second part of his question, uh, Dr. Mendel, that also uh, is asking about uh, risks uh, in a home-based model uh, of ketamine. So I think we should touch on that quickly and then hopefully we can pick up the um, momentum here. I'm trying to get through all these questions because we have a lot more to cover. Great. I'll, be, I'll try to be brief. In a clinic, your caregiver takes responsibility for and controls just about everything. The further you move away from that, the less likely conditions are to be optimum for a therapeutic outcome. Now, when you start giving ketamine at home to people, uh, maybe you're very responsible and you have a rapport with them and they've worked this out with their therapist so their therapist is available 
in good proximity to their experience. Maybe they have a good sitter. Maybe it can be done very, very well. The temptation for convenience and for profit to do it in a less than optimum fashion, to sell ketamine rather than selling care, is just very, very difficult to resist. Yeah, I mean, I think ultimately home based, you're not going to be monitored for your vitals or with a you know medical professional if something should happen. Ketamine is very, very safe, but uh, bad things can happen. You you know you are um, in a vulnerable state, uh, you know psychologically it is altered by the effects of ketamine. It is a sedative. Uh, you do feel like you've had more than just a few glasses of wine when you're getting a dose that's. Uh, optimal for mental health. It's not something you want to be running around on or doing stuff or driving or walking around the house with my trip on something or dog or a kid's toy or, you know, it's, you really need a controlled environment for it to do it safely. Uh, I hope you'll forgive us if we're being a little long-winded. Uh, we're going to pick up the pace a little here and and try to be more succinct with the rest of these questions. But thank you, Christian, for that one. Those, those were good. Uh, and uh, we have Shira here from Los Angeles, just thanking us for doing this. Thank you for being here, Shira. We so appreciate you. And uh, let's see. Uh, interesting. So give me just a second. Okay, this one is, does the age of the person taking ketamine matter? How long does the reaction to the drug last? My 53-year-old daughter has had some benefits from it. You want to jump in there, Dr. Mandel? Uh, the age, uh, we, we've had patients as young as nine years old uh, and as old as 82 years old. Uh, it's my sense, and this is not evidence, that people in middle life benefit the most. And I would count your daughter as being in middle life. Um, I don't think age makes a very big difference. Your where you are in life when you start emotionally makes a difference. If you're uh, ready to make a change, ketamine can really be the catalyst. If you're being made to come and you're resisting change, You'll defeat the ketamine. Yeah, yeah. I, we really can't underline that enough. People got to <laughs> participate. And, you know, we make a lot of lifestyle uh, recommendations for the pillars of wellness for patients. Talk therapy, healthy nutrition, adequate sleep, fitness, interpersonal relationships. We really support people in making the meaningful changes necessary. And a lot of those things are things that people already know that they, you know, should do or that it would be good for them to do. They don't have the energy or the motivation to do them. Ketamine gives that energy and motivation most of the time. It can really empower people. And then with that energy, it needs to be put to good use. So that's really, really uh, important. Um, also, as far as age, it does seem like, we don't have any real data on this, but it does seem like, you know, just speaking from experience, older patients tend to be a little bit more slower to respond. They take a little bit longer to see a benefit. For whatever reason, I don't think there is any real good answer as to why or what's going on. We could speculate. I think in the interest of time, we won't. But older patients sometimes see a little bit more of a delayed response, or they might need more infusions to start to see movement. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, we're going to move on. We have someone here uh, from the Netherlands, Amsterdam. That's awesome. And uh, they said, you know, thanks to your post last week, I signed up uh, for TMS therapy in Amsterdam. And I'd never heard about it before. And I'm so grateful that you all posted about it. And of course, uh, ketamine really helps. And you guys are doing great work. Thank you. That is awesome. Thank you so much for that. That's wonderful to see in here. Uh, we have, uh, let's see, uh, Jason in Oakland, California. He just wanted to say that he had a therapeutic infusion a couple of weeks ago. Uh, that's great, Jason. Uh, I hope that it was helpful to you. Um, hopefully you had more than just one, uh, generally a series of six is really what's indicated to produce the, the best possible result and the longest lasting result. Actually, a lot of the early research in this area was one single infusion, and it was only about seven to 10 days that people were experiencing uh, relief. 
And when protocols were developed to do a series of, of six is when uh, people are actually seeing a more pronounced benefit and a longer lasting one. So hopefully it helped Jason and, and you had more than one, but uh, if not, find someone who can give you more than one. Uh, I'm gonna skip around here, let's see. Okay, thank you for that. Someone's asking us to share. Uh, let's see. This is a long one, bear with me just a second while I read through this. <laughs> Okay, got it. Um, these are, we're going to try to cover these. These are some long questions. Okay. Ketamine has worked for me for depression, but has not helped OCD or anxiety. Um, what has your experience been? Is there a different protocol for OCD and anxiety? And it goes on, but let's start there. Uh, ketamine works very well with depression and suicidality. It also works very well for anxiety, but less well. And uh, there's a whole group of patients. I, I, I'll never forget, this has happened way more than once. Patients saying, you know, this is really great and I feel so much better, but how come you made me so anxious? And when you go back and you talk to them, they were anxious all along, but they were so depressed and they felt so helpless and hopeless and worthless and without any value or self-regard that they didn't really think of themselves as being anxious. As soon as you increase the self-esteem and you get people able to focus and concentrate and start to smell the roses, then they say, gee, you know, I'm still anxious. Many patients are less anxious. Ketamine can work well for anxiety. It sometimes doesn't work nearly as well. Uh, we have found anecdotally that those patients do very well with a course of TMS, which seems to take the non-depressed or the treated depressive and relieve their anxiety. And that's a treatment that we've just added to the clinic in this last year, and we're just launching uh, this month, actually, and we are accepting insurance for it. That's transcranial magnetic stimulation. It's another interventional psychiatry treatment, an in-office procedural thing. And I, I don't want to take a lot of time covering kind of what that is now, but I did want to just mention that, make people aware that that's an option at Ketamine Clinics Los Angeles as well. Just to complete the answer, uh, OCD is the most difficult to get people to leave behind them. People who are stuck with obsessions and compulsions have the hardest time. We've had some good success with uh, food dis uh, disordered eating. Uh, we've had some good success with, with obsessions. Uh, but when I say we have an 83% success rate, that's with depression and suicide and some of the symptoms of PTSD. That is not with OCD. What's an average across all mood disorders? We don't uh, we don't measure as closely in the, in the individual ones, but I yeah definitely OCD is much more difficult. Um, the other part of this question is that since my depression has been under control with ketamine, which is wonderful, happy to hear that. I have a maintenance dose about every six months. That's great. Um, it's really nice to see. And if I had it more frequently, could it help OCD and anxiety? Has it never helped the OCD and the anxiety even during the initial two to three week eight infusions? Yeah, unfortunately, if it didn't help you initially in your series, it's not likely to help you later on with more frequent follow-up. And we believe in the concept, philosophically, we subscribe to MED, the minimum effective dose. So we want people to have the least amount of medicine necessary to produce a therapeutic result for them. We don't want people to be taking drugs more than they need to or higher doses. And so, you know, if every six months is great to keep the depression at bay, that's fantastic. And we, we like to see that as opposed to someone feeling that they might need to come back more frequently. And unless it's likely to produce a better result, we would advise against it. And since the OCD and the anxiety weren't really helped initially, very, very unlikely. I wouldn't say impossible, but very unlikely that they would be helped now. Would you? I want to comment though, because yeah. we have patients who for financial or geographic reasons 
defer their boosters. We monitor all of our patients every single day with a mood monitor. We get it, they get it, and we talk about it. And sometimes people really begin to decline and because of uh, work obligations or geography or wanting to save money, they wait to come in until they're close to or they're crashed. And it's much harder to restore their benefit than people who come in timely. And the people who come in timely or even a little in advance of me do much, much better. It's interesting, people talk about being habituated or addicted or dependent upon ketamine. But in our experience, the interval between boosters tends to lengthen, not get closer, with repeated uh, treatment. So if after your first series of six, you needed boosters in eight or 10 weeks, um, your next boosters might be in, in 15 weeks and your next boosters might be 20 weeks. It's, um, it's sometimes it takes uh, more treatment than six to get yeah. the desired effect. I wanted to point that out in, the, in this person's question. Um, they, they actually mentioned that they had the uh, initial eight infusions and we're actually finding that more and more common uh, where patients are required, especially the really treatment refractory cases, the really tough uh, treatment resistant patients who have just tried pretty much everything out there um, are actually requiring eight or even 10 infusions in their initial series. So six is kind of the standard that works most of the time for most people. And most people do start to feel better within about a week or so of starting treatment. But there is an increasing uh, number of patients who actually need to add on two or four more infusions uh, at the end of their series. And I make that distinction of extending the series versus boosters because extending the series is in close proximity where you are, there's a stacking effect where you're building momentum upon the effects from one infusion to the next. And that needs to be done in close proximity, whereas boosters are at a, at a later date, usually months later, sometimes even years later, but generally in most cases, months later uh, for maintenance. So this person actually has two other questions. If we could try to address them really quickly, we actually have 65 more pending. So uh, I want to try to get through as many as we possibly can. I feel like we're both uh, maybe speaking a little more on each one than we need, but we're, we just like this work and we like being thorough. So uh, thanks for your patience as we as we navigate all these questions. Uh, the other question from this person is, uh, have you um, used ketamine for migraines and uh, has it been effective? I suffer from chronic migraine. Dr. Manel, if you want to jump in there real quick. For a certain kind of cluster headaches, it's great. For migraines, uh, not so much. And this is being well worked on. We don't, a few years after we started, two years after we started, we pretty much stopped doing pain as a specialty. This is really uh, what we can find our plate to. And so we don't treat a lot of headache anymore because we refer that to other practitioners. But it seems to me from what I know, and I'm not someone who treats headache, that actual migraine doesn't respond as well as some of the migraine-like syndrome. Yeah, really, um, you know, ketamine can be great for pain. Uh, it's a different protocol. Uh, there's several different protocols out there. We would do four hour long infusions and the total visit would be about six hours. It'd be much, much higher dose. We would do five of these in a, in a row, five days in a row, or maybe five in a week. So we do four in a row and then give it a couple of days off and then do that fifth infusion, but all generally within one week, four hours long each infusion and a, a rate that's often twice as much or sometimes even you know three times as much medicine as what people are receiving for mental health. So it's very much more intensive therapy, very different protocol. And a lot of the uh, pain, it really has to be true neuropathic pain, uh, CRPS, complex regional pain syndrome, uh, also known as uh, RSD or reflex sympathetic dystrophy. Uh, it has to really be true neuropathic pain. A lot of people who have more acute uh, kind of anatomic pain, they have like, you know, a bulge disc or, or something like that. It's not really going to respond or it will, but it won't feel better when the ketamine wears off in a matter of hours. 
uh, just like you know any other pain reliever that you take it and it wears off and the pain comes back. Uh, for ketamine to help to reset pain signals in the brain, uh, you really have to have a situation where the injury has healed and there's no real good explanation for why it's still hurting you. That's in really basic, simple terms of what CRPS and some of those other um, conditions are, are about. Um, and then this kind of ties in, I'll let you touch on this one real quick, Dr. Mandel, and then I think we really need to move on to the next person's questions, uh, is trigeminal neuralgia, the, the same same uh, question from the same person, participant. You know, have you used ketamine for trigeminal neuralgia? Has it been effective? I, I suffer from bilateral uh, trigeminal neuralgia. I think it's a miracle for, for trigeminal neuralgia. At least it's been in my clinic. Uh, it really works extraordinarily well and extraordinarily effectively in uh, modest doses. Just you don't have to do a full series, two or three infusions. If it's truly trigeminal neuralgia, you have a very good chance of getting relief. Great. Okay. Thank you for those great questions. I'm gonna. Try to keep us moving. Plowing. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, we still have 64 questions. I love it. It's amazing to see this level of interest. We appreciate it. And we're going to try to be even more efficient in our answers. So uh, this uh, anonymous user says, uh, do most people require more than one infusion? Uh, yes, I think we've addressed that by now, but we do provide a series of six. It's really important. Most patients don't benefit until a day or two after the third infusion. Uh, ketamine does work very, very quickly. There are people who have one single infusion and as soon as it's over, they feel the weight has been lifted. They feel amazing. They're inspired. That is not to be expected. That is not typical. It's very possible, but that's not typical. Typically, two or three infusions before people start to benefit and you do need to continue. You don't have the third and you feel better the next day and say, great, I'm done. I feel better now. You need to continue to build that momentum, increase the benefit and also extend it in terms of its duration. That is all linked to how long it lasts to doing this series. And that's for any mental health condition and pain uh, as well. So thank you for that question. Uh, we have uh, Gaetano here in New Jersey. Uh, do you guys currently accept insurance for ketamine? Uh, if yes, what insurances are covered? And when you guys ready to expand to the New Jersey, New York area? I'll, I'll take this one real quick if you don't mind, Dr. Mandel. Um, we are not able to take insurance for ketamine infusions uh, because they don't really pay, except in the case of Kaiser SoCal. Uh, they are, uh, we are contracted with them and they are paying for some of their subscribers to have infusions with us. It is ultimately on a case-by-case -case basis. It is at the sole discretion of the psychiatrist at Kaiser, whether or not they want to make that referral. And if they do make the referral, we will take care of those patients and Kaiser will pay for it, which is amazing progress. Uh, as far as all of the other payers at this time, which we are in network with 10 of the largest payers in California, none of them are paying. Uh, we think that will change. And that's something that we're working hard on. But at, at the moment, no. The reason we're in network with them is for psychiatric medication management. We provide general psychiatry services, your conventional you know, management of people's prescriptions. And we do accept insurance for that. And patients often have to pay very little to nothing out of pocket. Uh, for that service uh, and also uh, tra uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, TMS insurance will pay for it, which is very effective and doesn't have any of the side effects of prescription medications. So that's why we take insurance and hopefully more payers will, will wisen up to the fact that ketamine is actually uh, faster acting, safer, more effective and less costly for them to pay for it for their subscribers than the treatments that they're already paying for it. As far as when we're coming to the East Coast, I don't know. Uh, we'll get back to you on that. <laughs> we got to have a couple more locations in LA and California first, uh, but uh, we'd love to come out East too. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, let's see, where are treatments administered? Dr. Mandel, do you want to answer this one? Yeah, we have a purpose-built clinic, a suite of offices in, in a medical building. Uh, each patient gets a private room. Uh, with soundproofing, with um, a really comfortable recliner, with an eye shield, with uh, noise-canceling headphones. We haven't discussed music, but music is extremely important in the therapy. Um, so that's where we administer our care. And our clinic is located in Culver City at the edge of the Playa District, uh, like Playa del Rey, Westchester, where they all come together for those who might know Los Angeles, uh, just off the 405. 
and by the Howard Hughes LA Mall. So that's where we are. It's a 5,000 square foot facility. Uh, we have a team of over a dozen there and it's a very, very serene, peaceful and, and beautiful site. Um, thank you for that question. Moving along, someone is saying, uh, I'm not gonna say the name because of the nature of the question, but they say he was my psychoanalyst in the 60s. I don't know if they're talking about you, but that's pretty pretty wild. Uh, very, very cool if that's if that's the case, or maybe you're referring to someone else, I don't know, but uh, moving right along here. Let's see. Yeah, some people are saying I can't see the questions. We're going to be kind of revealing them as we go through and answer them. So I'm just kind of opening them up as we go. Let's see. Oh, here's a great question. Uh, so how do you collaborate with other mental health professionals, referrals from non-psychedelic practitioners, et cetera? Well, we make an effort to reach out and co collaborate with all of the people trying to take care of the patient. We have patients that are blessed with a lot of resources, some of them, and we speak with their trainers and their nutritionists or their dietitians, uh, as well as their psychologists and their psychiatrists. Uh, we try to collaborate with everyone who's trying to take care of the patient. Ketamine is not a standalone. Ketamine is a facilitator of all the other things that other caregivers are attempting to do. It makes the patient better able to make use of everybody's interventions. We do it mostly by phone, sometimes by email, very rarely in person. Uh, but the answer, I guess, is we collaborate as closely as we are welcome. Yeah, and we have a good uh, diverse team in house with different backgrounds and skill sets. As I, as I mentioned earlier, you know, Dr. Manobi is an anesthesiologist with a master's in psychology. We have psychiatrists who are double board certified on staff. We have psychiatric nurse practitioners, registered nurses. So any patient who comes to the clinic gets a really, uh, a whole team really behind them uh, to support them. And as far as any of the people on their team outside of our office, we are really big on collaboration and believe in a more you know holistic treatment model and working together to really better serve the patient. So we accept referrals, we refer out. Um, there's definitely things that we're not you know able to do in house. Uh, we don't provide talk therapy in house at this time, so we do refer out to a variety of therapists. Some who might specialize in you know prep and integration or in working with psychedelics or others who may not, depending on the needs of the of the client. And then a variety of other uh, practitioners as well. I mean, if, if somebody needs a good dentist, I'm happy to connect them with one. So really, whatever whatever we can do to help. Um, we are looking to incorporate more uh, psychotherapy in house this year, so we'll be sharing more about that. So uh, let's keep it moving. We have uh, who stays with you during the treatment and what is their training? That's a, a great question that I'll just jump into real quick. So we have the team I just mentioned, variety of clinicians in clinic who are monitoring uh, patients under their direct observation the entire time and also with hospital grade monitoring equipment of vitals. Um, so generally, it's most of the time, it's going to be the, the RNs, registered nurses, and it's also going to be the psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner for a first line of, of interaction with patients at their visits. And their training is extensive. I mean, they're obviously licensed, credentialed in their, in their training in, in those ways, RN and, and uh, NP, but they also have to have a BLS, basic life support, uh, ACLS, advanced cardiac life support. Um, moderate sedation training from the American Society of Anesthesiologists. These are things that we require. They're not necessarily uh, prevalent at other clinics, but this is the kind of additional training that we look for in terms of people's knowledge of this treatment and their uh, safety. And of course, they've trained with Dr. Mandel, and we have extensive protocols, policies, and procedures that we've developed over a decade of how to do this work, how to do it safely, effectively, how to optimize it, and how to really just create the ideal experience uh, for the individual patient. So everyone in the clinic is very tuned into creating a really, a very kind of white glove, high level, concierge level experience for every individual patient. Uh, moving along here, we have Crystal, and thank you for the, I appreciate the, the hearts and the thumbs ups and the applauses that we're seeing. That's very encouraging. Thank you for that. Uh, we have Crystal in Denver, in Chile, Denver, um, and she's a, with a research organization, and they've conducted research in academy for many years. Very cool. 
Um, and you're presently initiating a study into ketamine treatment for safety and effectiveness, and you're excited to learn from us both. Well, that's very sweet. We are excited to learn more about you and your research. Please reach out to us. We also have a lot of data that we've collected over the last, uh, well, we've been doing this work for 10 years. I'd say we haven't been good about collecting data except for maybe over the last six, first, you know, three or four, we weren't as cognizant of that, but definitely six, seven years, we have a lot of really strong data. We would love to publish some research with that as far as what we're finding. So maybe we can talk about that sometime after uh, offline. Uh, so thank you for that, Crystal. Uh, moving along. So I think this question was sent before. Yeah, I see the timestamp here. This question was sent before we actually uh, spoke to this. And I think we've already done that in a satisfactory way. But it's to respond to Matthew Perry news story and how the misinformation can cause challenges for safe medical practices. Um, is there anything else that you would want to say about that, Dr. Mandela? Or do you think we covered that piece? I think we covered the case, but the point is the media, and you'll have to decide for yourself whether it's uh, ignorance or innocence or something else, loves to conflate disasters and ketamine with the therapeutic use of ketamine. Uh, it, it gets more clicks and it serves their sponsors. Frankly, the ketamine is very cheap. It's the care that costs a lot of money. Uh, if your ketamine goes head to head with any other antidepressant, ketamine wins hands down. And for that reason, there's a tremendous effort to dump on ketamine because it just ain't, ain't gonna be vanquished in a fair fight. It just is so much more effective and safer and faster that, uh, Anyone who doesn't have an issue or an interest in getting something else sold is going to come down on the side of ketamine therapy. Yeah, you know, there's been no cases, not one single case that we could find of, of uh, ketamine causing death in a therapeutic or in a clinical environment. In the very few times, there was a meta-analysis done where in overdose cases, there were only around like 350 or so that were found where ketamine was present and that actually resulted in death. And virtually all of them uh, were combining other drugs. It's not just ketamine by itself. And, you know, about 350, you know, total on the internet that we could find, really small number. There's actually around 140,000 alcohol related deaths every single year. There's well over 100,000 that pertain to opioids. So just to put things into perspective, you know, deaths that are even where ketamine is even involved in those cases are exceedingly rare. And that's one of the reasons why the media and others like to latch onto them and really make a big deal about them because they really don't actually happen very much. And it also, as Dr. Mandel mentioned, ketamine really disrupts the status quo. Uh, it really takes away market share from higher margin, less effective treatments. Yeah, just to... Go back to Mr. Perry. Uh, Mr. Perry, associating Mr. Perry with ketamine is, is, it's very unfortunate. And yes, he did die with ketamine in his system. Um, it has nothing whatsoever to do with the medicine we're using for therapeutic purposes. It's the same molecule, but nothing else about it is related. Yeah, and if I could just add quickly, I mean, for those who are, who are listening and wondering, well, why is, Ketamine is so wonderful, and why are people bashing it? Well, it, the, the patent is up. It's a, it's a cheap generic drug. It's low margin. About half a dozen different people make it in the U.S. You know, there's no real gain uh, for, for any individual entity on, on ketamine, you know, being protected or promoted or marketed, whereas there's tremendous um, monetary uh, gain and other gains uh, in, in ensuring that um, uh, alternatives are, are protected, defended, marketed, promoted, et cetera. So, so just for example, not, not to be too much on the nose, but the um, FDA approved antidepressant that uses an isomer of ketamine is uh, literally more than, uh, is about 
300 times more costly, 300 times more costly than ketamine, and it's less effective. Yeah, it's talking about uh, ketamine nasal spray, and, th and that's largely a result of the root of administration. It's not because of the drug itself is that. That's the molecule. Um, but it's about 40% effective, whereas IV infusions in our clinic are 83% effective. And it's a name brand product that goes for a much, much higher uh, higher price. Um, moving on, uh, where is ketamine? Uh, this is an interesting question. Where is the ketamine sourced from? Uh, we get it from pharmaceutical distributors and manufacturers, um, legitimate channels of, of, of acquiring any kind of medical uh, medicine or medical product uh, as a clinic. Um, let me see what this next one is. Some of these are a little bit long, so just bear with me. Some of these I, I, I just don't really understand, to be totally honest with you. So I'm just kind of looking for uh, one that, that I do. Okay, this is a good question uh, from another anonymous person. Uh, how do you measure efficacy uh, among your patients? I think we've talked a little bit about this since this question was asked, but we can uh, quickly revisit that, Dr. Mandel. The gold standard for uh, measuring effectiveness is how does the patient feel and how does the patient function? Often with young males, they start to function much better than they report feeling initially. Uh, a 19 year old who still lives at home will say, yes, not doing much for me. But the mom will say, you know, he took out the trash. Then he came to dinner on time. He offered to help clear the table. The guy is totally unaware of that. That's a change. Uh, he's engaging with people. Uh, more, and I don't want to stereotype it. It doesn't always happen this way, but sometimes the behavioral change precedes the mood change. But the patient is the gold standard. But we don't re rely on these reports, A, because they're kind of touchy-feely, fuzzy, and we want to try to be scientific, although that's really the bottom line is how we do it. But in order to have data, in order to be able to measure before and after and during, we use paper and pencil tests and structured interviews. And our paper and pencil tests typically are the Beck depression inventory, the Madras, the PHQ-9. We use an anxiety scale sometimes. And yes. we have a mood monitor, which we use every day. It's an encrypted text message with the patient. It takes them no time at all. Uh, they text back our number from 1 to 10 as to how they're feeling. And of course, one day's information is nothing. But when you graph it, it's just dramatic. And you draft it against what's happening in their lives and what's happening in the clinic with their infusions. Great. Yeah. So lots of, uh, you know, uh, objective measures as well as subjective. Uh, thank you for that question. So this is, this is a good one. Um, do you ever discontinue or recommend a discontinuation of ketamine treatment for patients? When, how, why do you do this? We treat, we treat almost all comers. Uh, we don't treat uh, homicidal patients. We don't treat uh, bipolar patients who are hypomanic or severely hypomanic at the time of treatment. Sometimes, and it's not common, but sometimes hypomanic patients or, or bipolar patients become amped up a lot during their series. In that case, we increase the interval between infusions or actually suspend the series pending better modulation. We also like them to be on stabilizers, although unlike a great many other places, we don't make that a requirement. Right. Um, so this question is, what medication interactions are you concerned about? Um, do you require patients to discontinue, wash out from any other medications, which and why? I'll, I'll kind of take that one real quick. 
so medication interactions, there's not too many. There's not really very many contraindications uh, with ketamine. Uh, we do ask that people try to space out the use of their benzos a little bit, maybe abstain six hours before and after. It's not dangerous. It's not going to cause problems, but it can kind of blunt the response to the ketamine. So uh, we ask if possible that people are able to do that. Um, you want to add to that as well, Dr. Mendel? I would. There's one medicine that's very useful that can be a problem lamictal. with ketamine, and that's lamictal. Yeah. Lamotrigine. Mm -hmm. In our clinic, we are pretty, uh, and we're not, we really don't want people to have lamotrigine before or after their infusions within six hours. Yeah, that can just cause a rash that's rare but can be dangerous. Uh, so that's that's one of the reasons why we ask people not to take it. may medication. also blunt the effect. Yeah. As far as like washing out, no, most people continue to take the medications that they've been taking. We are advocates, as I mentioned earlier, of, of you know, the minimum effective dose of simplifying, you know, polypharmacy is a real issue in this country. A lot of people taking a lot of different medications, having a lot of very negative side effects, taking more medications to deal with the side effects of their other medications. And it's a very vicious cycle. So for anyone who wants to reduce the overall medication load. We are happy to work with them on that. Um, you know, Dr. Manel, our psychiatrist, can work with them on, on weaning off of meds or simplifying that regimen uh, if that's something they want to do, but it's not a requirement and it's not necessarily a benefit from treatment. Uh, this is a good question. Knowing that uh, psilocybin is not yet legal in California, what is the difference between ketamine and psilocybin and how are the results different? I don't know if you want to briefly speak to that one, Dr. Ketamine is a medicine that was approved in 1970. It's been given literally many billions with a B of times under clinical circumstances over more than 50 years. Um, psilocybin has been given for millennia as a sacred plant and uh, or, or it's where we get our psilocybin from mushrooms has been used that way. Psilocybin as a, as a therapeutic agent has tremendous promise. I'm very optimistic about it. I don't want to step over my optimism to unbridled enthusiasm for something we know nothing about really. No question. I'm a client. I'm a huge fan of your clinic and your staff. Uh, they've made my life immeasurably better, and I'm here to support. Thank you for that. We appreciate that. That's really nice to see. Um, this person asks, uh, and again, forgive me, some of these I think are before we covered the material that's in the question, but I'm, I'm just trying to go through them in order as I see them. This says, do you provide IV or IM in the clinic? Which do you find more effective? I think we covered that pretty well. We do IV infusions. It has a lot of nuanced advantages in terms of, of safety and efficacy. Um, <laughs> For instance, a uh, guy Tano asking if I'm going to give a little ketamine wrap. Uh, not today, but maybe next time. <laughs> uh, for those who don't know, I'm passionate about uh, spoken word and rapping and, and poetry and freestyling. It's something that I like to do for fun. Um, let's see. Yeah, this question, I think we already answered as well. Uh, again, just kind of trying to get through them in order here and pick up the pace because we still have a lot to get through. Uh, do patients have successful outcomes after the mini program, less than 10 sessions and less than you know six months? And then they typically need resets or new treatments over time. Again, I think we definitely covered that. We do a series of six infusions. Sometimes it's eight or 10 in that initial series. Uh, and then patients will come back on an as needed basis, generally three or four months later, and it varies widely. And when they return, it's a pair of boosters. It's not another entire series uh, that people are getting in most cases. Um, uh, this is a good question. I'll let you uh, jump on on this one, Dr. Mandel. Uh, how do you determine the appropriate dose for each patient? They actually said microdose, but we're, we're not actually giving microdoses because a microdose is an imperceptible amount, but we are actually giving enough that people are altered by it. So it's not a microdose, but it is sub-anesthetic. It's a smaller amount than is traditionally given uh, to be used as a sedative. So Dr. Mandel, how do we determine the dose uh, for patients? It's a great question. Uh, because the original research uh, on ketamine therapeutically gave half a milligram per kilogram over 40 minutes. And in our work early on, we determined that 50 or 55 minutes produced a better result. So we started doing that. We then found that 
uh, we back calculated and, and 40, um, 40 minutes of half a milligram per kilogram equates to about 12.5 micrograms per kilogram per minute. We don't give ketamine by the hour. We give ketamine by the minute. And we give it via a computer control infusion pump and through narrow bore tubing, micro bore tubing, really. Right. So that we get a result very quickly and very precisely. We start our doses at 14 micrograms, which is a little more than 12 and a half. And we, unlike both many clinics, we escalate our doses during infusions. Because if you give somebody uh, X amount of medicine on day one. And then you give them X amount of medicine on day two. They say to you, how come you didn't give me so much medicine today? Because their being and the ketamine is starting to work together. And it takes more ketamine to get them where they need to go to do the work. Very important to be able to escalate those both within and between infusions. Thank you for that. I'm going to try, you know, I know we're, we're getting close to time here. I want to try to run through some shorter, quicker ones and kind of ping pong these a little bit. Uh, do you see in uh, the foreseeable future Medicare coverage? I think it's very possible. We're hopeful for it. Um, you know, again, I think a lot of payers are really focused more on um, money than they are on the overall you know, good goodwill or or benefit to the public, and if they run the arithmetic as some of them are starting to do now, they're they're seeing that actually they would not only help a lot more people, but they would actually save money if they provided coverage for ketamine infusions. Uh, you know, that people would actually not consume resources in other areas for less effective treatments, or they wouldn't have to pay for, you know, inpatient hospital stays or deal with some of the other consequences of untreated depression. So it is starting to turn. It's just really glacial, unfortunately. Um, let's see, can you have, uh, this is an interesting one. Can you have TMS therapy and ketamine treatment at the same time? Yeah, there are people who are doing that. Um, we're not intending to initially, as we're just kind of getting started with TMS, we're going to keep those two as separate treatments for now. But uh, there's some interesting uh, People, people doing some interesting work with that where they're actually providing them together. And the two treatments combined form almost a third treatment that's unique. It's not like just doing two different treatments together. It really creates its own sort of synergy and its own separate thing. And some people say they've gotten good results. I'm not aware of really much research in that area at all, though. Any any real data on it? Are you, Dr. Mendel? No, I'm not. And I, I like your answer. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, will, the, uh, will the recording be available to us? Yes, it will. We're going to email this to all of the participants and to those who could not make it. Um, let's see. <laughs> okay, this is a good one uh, from Sandy. So let's say someone has never done ketamine and was nervous on how they would feel. How would you explain the feeling uh, to set them at ease? Oh. It's not like anything you've experienced before. So you, you need to increase your trust quotient and your cura curiosity quotient. And we need to do all we can to make you relaxed and to make you comfortable. And come into it with hope and expectation rather than with concerns about being harmed. You will not be harmed. It's possible that you won't be helped, but you will not be helped. Yeah, I also just add to that to say, because we're providing IV infusions, we can decrease the rate of infusion to lighten the experience a little bit, the intensity of it, if you are anxious or uncomfortable in any way, and we can stop it. And ketamine has a very short half-life and it wears off uh, very quickly. And so if we stop the infusion, the effects are gonna dissipate rapidly and you're monitored with hospital grade monitoring equipment. We have an incredibly attentive, compassionate uh, team of, of medical professionals where we have a very clean, quiet, and, and safe environment. And we're gonna be there with you the entire time and to make sure that you're taken care of. So you can trust that you're in good hands. Um, as far as the actual experience itself, it really does vary widely from person to person. And we, we talked about that a little bit earlier, but it's often experienced as a really 
um, you know, interesting or inspiring kind of an experience. It's not typical that it's uncomfortable or unpleasant for people, though that is possible. It's not not typical. Um, let's see. This one is asking about price. It's a good question. So this person just asked about pricing. Uh, so we charge thirty nine hundred for a series of six infusions, um, and there's a three hundred dollar intake fee up front, and then it's six hundred dollars per infusion after that. So that's the pricing. Um, we offer interest free financing as well through a couple of different options. People have six months or can sometimes like for more than six months uh, to pay it back without any additional fees. Um, let's see, keeping it moving here. Are you guys training staff now or preparing for when uh, MDMA obtains FDA approval? I heard it might be approved for PTSD by August 2024. We heard that too, and we're real enthused about it. And we're real admirers of Rick Doblin, and we really think he's just done amazing work. He really deserves it. all his accolades. Uh, it's a new drug. We are very, very, very empirical. If it helps suffering, we're going to use it. We're excited about MDMA and other psychedelic medicines as well. Also, hats off to Doblin for his you know, championing this cause for 30 years. It's absolutely incredible. And it, it does look like it's going to happen with MDMA sometime next year. Very exciting. There's still so, so much to uncover as far as regulatory environment and requirements in what is uh, going to be most optimum for patients and the settings, you know, affordability and accessibility. Uh, there's a lot that needs to be uncovered still of how exactly that's going to fit into the clinic, but we're very enthusiastic about it. And if you look at the results of MDMA assisted psychotherapy for PTSD in their uh, in their trials, it's just unbelievable. Like really, nothing else that we we've, we've seen. Though uh, I will say, ketamine is extremely effective for PTSD. Um, so let's see here. Next question: uh, Does this treatment help uh, ADHD symptoms? Uh, I would say generally no. Uh, it might help a little bit with attention or focus or quieting the chatter in people's minds, but it's not exactly a uh, treatment for ADHD. That's definitely not a, an indication that we typically would recommend it for. Dr. Mandel, this question is, do you treat addiction? And if you do, do you dose it similar to mood disorders? Great question. Ketamine is extraordinarily effective for uh, opiate use disorder, for alcohol use disorder, uh, marginally affected for tobacco use disorder, but it's amazing for alcohol. It's amazing for opiates. Um, we prefer to treat people who are no longer dependent on these substances. Um, it's amazing for people who come in having been abstinent and starting to have cravings and helping them to reduce or eliminate their cravings, or at least give them the pause that keeps them from going down that rabbit hole. This person is a comment, um, says you collaborate with us to prevent burnout for our staff who does direct services to unhoused people. We value you, the support you guys give to our team and supporting the wider community. Your work touches people that you don't even know. That's beautiful. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm grateful for you and the work that you're doing on the opportunity to be a service. Uh, let's see. Uh, not a question, but more of an experience. This is from Michelle. I went through loading ketamine therapy in 2020 here in Austin, Texas. I had severe treatment resistant depression and suicidal ideation for decades. This treatment literally saved my life and 100% cured me. I'm so grateful that I found yep. this. That's amazing. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, let's see. Hopefully we can just get through a couple more um a couple more questions. I know we're getting really close to time here and I'm really grateful for everyone who has stayed on with us and is interested in continuing the conversation. Um, let's see here. I'm looking for one last question and then I think we're gonna have to call it for today. Uh, let's see. In your, I think we kind of addressed this earlier, but it was asked more recently, so we'll, we'll reiterate. 
I know we'll make this, I think we'll have to make it our last one. In your experience, how often uh, on average do responders have to come in to maintain the positive effects of the ketamine on their mental state? Um, uh, once every couple of weeks, once a month, what's an average interval? Generally, we're seeing, you know, every two to three months, uh, people are coming back for a pair of boosters, generally. And it does vary widely. On the short end, people have only received a few weeks of benefit. And on the long end, we have a number of patients, uh, not a lot, but uh, more than one or two, who have actually gone over two years. They were able to get more than two years of relief from one initial series, which is incredible. But definitely, those are outliers, not to be expected. So it's possible, but but rare. On average, people are experiencing around two to three months of relief. And uh, generally, as they're able to really embrace the lifestyle changes and continue to come back over time, they come back less often. You want to add anything there, Dr. Mandel? No, I think that was good. The, so, the, uh, the, the uh, what will you say in science, the standard deviation of the average duration of beneficial effect is extraordinarily broad. As, as Sam points out, it's from weeks to years. And I think the, um, the modal is about three months. Um, and as I said earlier, the interval between needing boosters tends to lengthen with treatment time. Let's do closing thoughts. It's 2.30 Pacific time. There was 46 more questions that we didn't get to. I think we're going to have to answer these. In uh, one of the, one of the uh, questions was a suggestion that we answer some of these offline, which I think is a great idea, and we will do. We're going to read through all of them. We'll either send out some sort of uh, an email, or maybe we'll do a video where we can quickly address uh <laughs> I, I'm laughing at myself using the word quickly because if there's anything that we're not great at, it's being quick, but we just have a lot to say. We're passionate about this. Um, but we're going to try to very uh, succinctly address the rest of the questions offline and then send them to participants and to those who couldn't be here. We might add some to the Q&A, uh, uh, excuse me, FAQ section of our website. We may do a video and send that out or just send an email, but we will try to continue to keep this conversation going. I want to sincerely thank you all for staying this long. I want to thank everyone who came, even to those who had to leave. Uh, I hope that you got value from this and uh, we are here and available. If people want to contact us, you can contact the clinic. There's a lot of very good information on our website, ketamineclinics.com. Uh, you can call us 310-270-0625. Again, that's 310-270-0625. Uh, consultations are free. There's no obligation. We are passionate about this work and about educating people on it. And maybe we'll do another webinar sometime. Uh, this was definitely a fun exercise. And again, I just, I really sincerely thank you. I hope you got a lot of value from it. We definitely learned uh, as well. All right. Take care.